Build Academy that is very important to us is our connections and our listening to what people um, with lived experience have to say, and that it goes across all areas of disability and enabling good lives. So one of the um, important things for us is our karakia. Whakaronga, 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 and as I mentioned, this is about for Bird Academy the importance to us of listening, listening to what is important, listening to the voices talking to us around what is those areas within um, the lived experience. Um, there's a full description and translation here, um, but it is an important thing that um, we've been gifted and is um, important to us. So just pre-warning you for next month's one, Johnny is going to um, fly in on the waves of um, technology and talk to us from Sydney. Um, so please put that in your diaries ready for next time. So it gives me great pleasure to um, introduce uh, Grace. Grace is an occupational therapist um, who specialises in hand therapy. She's based in Wellington, is working part-time as a hand therapist at Hutt Hospital while she's completing her PhD full-time, so she's actually working pretty hard at the moment. Um, she's going to talk to you on parts of her um, PhD that she's started and hopefully will be completing in the next year or so. Um, so Grace. Kia ora everybody, thank you so much for the opportunity to present to you all today at your research forum. Um, as Jean said, my name is Grace Griffiths um, and I am doing um, a study looking at lived experiences of diagnosis and treatment for complex regional pain syndrome. So the studies that I am presenting today form um, phase one and two of a multi-stage um, mixed methods project that, um, that I'm conducting. Um, and the purpose of our research is to provide recommendations for a New Zealand management pathway for upper limb complex regional pain syndrome that's based on people's lived experiences. So uh, before I discuss the findings from the two, um, first two studies that we have done and what this means for the rest of our research, I'll just give you a little bit of an overview of complex regional pain syndrome <coughs> or CRPS so that you um, understand what, what I'm talking about and why it's important. So CRPS is characterised by severe pain and sensory motor and autonomic changes. It usually occurs after an injury to a limb, but the injury can be mild and in some cases there's no initiating trauma. It usually affects one limb and most frequently the upper limb, but can spread to involve additional limbs. The hallmark symptom of CRPS is continuous pain disproportionate to the inciting event. Additional sensory symptoms include pain with light touch that would not normally be considered pain inducing or allodynia, severe pain with stimulus that should only be slightly painful or hyperalgesia, and heightened sensitivity to normal sensations or hyperesthesia. But it's the concurrent signs of autonomic dysfunction that distinguish CRPS from all other pain conditions. You can actually see CRPS. So visual signs include any combination of local edema and or sweating, and changes to hair growth, nails, skin temperature or colour. Motor dysfunction can include restricted range of motion, weakness and tremor, um, and reduced bone density or osteopenia can also occur on x-ray imaging, but this usually occurs down the track and isn't required for diagnosis. Known risk factors for developing CRPS include, but aren't limited to, early uncontrolled baseline pain, extremity injuries, especially crush injuries and intraarticular fractures, surgery, immobilisation and being female. Existing pain conditions and genetics also play a role. While chronic pain is common, affecting one in four people, CRPS is classified as a rare pain condition. The latest and largest population-based study to date was performed in the Netherlands in 2007 and showed an incidence of 26.2 per 100,000 person years. So if we assume that that um, study was representative um, of the New Zealand population of 5 million, we could roughly estimate a New Zealand yearly incidence of 1,350. 
CRPS is at least three times more common in women than men, especially in women who are postmenopausal. And as previously mentioned, in adults, it is more common in the upper limb than the lower limb, um, partly um, my interest being, being a hand therapist. CRPS is less common in children, and again, females are more frequently affected than males. In children, the lower limb is more frequently affected than the upper limb. So in terms of what causes it, um, it's not completely understood, which is unhelpful, um, but several theories have been put forward. The general consensus currently is that there is an interaction between an initial inflammatory response, sympathetic nervous system dysregulation, and maladaptive neuroplastic changes. People with CRPS may experience hampered inactivation of the initial initially adaptive and protective inflammatory response. This leads to vasomotor dysfunction in the form of impaired capillary permeability and interstitial edema. Consequently, oxygen reduces and acid increases in the region, um, which leads to chemical and neural changes peripherally, centrally, and throughout the involved body systems, which further maintains CRPS. People with CRPS have in the past often been accused of somaticizing or malingering, uh, like in other chronic pain conditions, the more pain and the more physical restrictions a person has, the greater the likelihood of psychological distress. And obviously CRPS is associated with a lot of pain and a lot of physical restrictions. So a vicious cycle can and does often occur where pain, distress and disability maintain each other. So it's now known that pre-existing psychological conditions do not cause crypts to develop. However, as in other centrally sensitizing pain conditions, increased emotional arousal contributes to wind-up mechanisms in the spinal cord and neuroplastic changes to pain modulation, um, re resulting in reduced pain inhibition and continuing the cycle. So assessing and treating uh, psychological factors is therefore a critical aspect of CRPS management. With regard to prognosis, this is also difficult to identify, um, partly because signs, symptoms, and combinations of these can significantly differ between patients, fluctuate over time, disappear entirely, or persist. In the New Zealand-based prospective study of 59 people with recent onset of CRPS, Ben and colleagues found that rates of almost all signs and symptoms reduced significantly over the first year, greatest in the first six months and plateauing thereafter. Only 5.4% of participants were completely symptom-free at one year, and a quarter of participants still met full criteria for a diagnosis of CRPS after one year. Generally speaking, children have more favorable outcomes than adults. However, because it is uh, more rare in children, it can take longer for it to be recognized, thus delaying the start of appropriate therapy um, and influencing prognosis. And then spreading of CRPS is understandably a big concern for people. Uh, we don't know much about it at this time, and it probably <coughs> occurs less often than what the internet would have um, people believe, especially when CRPS is well managed. What we do know is that spreading occurs more frequently with younger age onset of CRPS, and mostly in the more severe cases, and that it usually occurs contralaterally, so from, for example, left hand to right hand. But all that to say, early recognition and intervention is key, but there are a few challenges to this. So this, um, these are the very best criteria for a diagnosis of CRPS. Um, they are the international gold standard for diagnosis. Um, there are no tests to confirm CRPS. It's a diagnosis of exclusion, um, and the diagnosis is clinical. So to meet Budapest criteria for CRPS, the patient must have continuing pain disproportionate to any inciting event. They must also report at least one symptom in three or more of the categories. The clinician must be able to observe at least one sign in two or more of the categories, and no other diagnosis should be able to better explain the signs or symptoms. Easy, right? <laughs> Obviously, the line between CRPS and normal responses to inflammation, immobilization, and other persistent pain conditions can be easily blurred, even with careful use of our gold standard Budapest criteria. So already that indicates that diagnosing CRPS is not all that straightforward, and this has significant implications for the person in pain. Similarly, treatment guidelines are not particularly clear. 
the general consensus is that prevention is better than cure, and failing that, that an early interdisciplinary team approach is the gold standard. So this flowchart is from the 2018 UK guidelines for CRPS management. Notice that it suggests intensive physiotherapy as the first line of treatment. Physiotherapy is a profession, not a therapy. Therapies can be provided by a range of rehabilitative professionals or specialties. So that includes physiotherapists, occupational therapists, hand therapists, chiropractors, massage therapists, osteopaths, domoa practitioners, etc. But while clearly important for perhaps management, these individual therapies, um, individual therapies provided by these people have not been well investigated. So that's led on to our um, literature review. Uh, many literature reviews have compiled rehabilitative treatment approaches for CRPS, but these either don't consider the strength of the evidence uh, for the treatments, or they don't specify whether their recommendations are for upper or lower limb treatment. So we don't yet know what differences there might be between upper and lower limb CRPS. Um, the upper limb is vastly different to the lower limb um, in both form and function. Our hands are both visible and highly sensory. With our hands we express ourselves and experience and interact with our worlds in quite different ways than with our feet. And given these special qualities of the hand and the significant visual, motor and sensory symptoms characteristic of CRPS, a one-size-fits-all treatment approach may not be appropriate. So that's where our first study um, came, came in looking at the evidence for non-pharmacological treatment of upper limb CRPS. We systematically searched 13 databases with the same search terms, which resulted in a total of 38 studies that were eligible for our um, review. After we extracted data from each of these, we appraised these with the Crow Critical Appraisal Tool, and then we um, used a qualitative descriptive analysis approach to determine patterns in the data. We identified five intervention categories from the data, sensory retraining, kinesiotherapy, manual therapies, physical modalities, and interdisciplinary treatment programs. Um, the quality range and median for each intervention category is on this slide. As you can see, the biggest intervention category was sensory retraining with 13 studies compared to seven or less in the other categories. And as you can also see, there's quite a big range of the quality of studies in each category. So sensory retraining interventions um, were those designed to enhance either sensory function or the communication between sensory and motor signals. These included prism adaptation, graded motor imagery, virtual reality, and body shadows. Um, the quality ranges and medians for each intervention subcategory is also on the slide. Um, and many of these particular studies lost points for um, lacking rationale for the intervention provided. Kinesiotherapy interventions were provided by physiotherapists, chiropractors, and occupational therapists. They commonly included passive and active range of movement exercises. Some included strengthening exercises, and some incorporated graded functional activity. Programs also frequently included um, modalities, including heat. Many of these studies did not describe the exact content of the interventions. Manual therapies were interventions that used hands-on techniques to address clinical signs and symptoms. So these interventions included manual lymphatic drainage um, therapy, thoracic manipulation techniques, ultrasound guided dry needling, leech therapy, and Chinese scalp acupuncture. Unfortunately, many of these studies were particularly subjective with their outcome <coughs> measures, so we did not deem their results um, overall as particularly reliable and the quality scores reflect this. And physical modalities are any medium that transmits um, physical forces to or through the person, such as heat, cold, pressure, water, light, sound, or electricity. So in this study, these included beamer therapy, neuromuscular electrical stimulation compared to extremity whirlpool bath, laser therapy compared to interferential current therapy, transcranial magnetic stimulation, and TENS therapy. The main issues with studies in this category were questionable ethical practices and drawing inferences inconsistent with the strength of the data. Interdisciplinary treatment programs always included pharmacology and physiotherapy intervention, and sometimes included psychology or occupational therapy. But like um, kinesiotherapy programs, the content of interdisciplinary treatment programs by each profession was often not well defined. 
the outcome measures used to assess the intervention outcomes in these studies primarily consider physical parameters such as pain intensity, strength, range of movement, edema and perceptual abilities. Um, many case studies did not describe the use of any measurement tools but mentioned clinical signs um, before versus after treatment. Less than half of the studies measured patient reported function or outcomes and the DASH questionnaire was the primary outcome measure used um, to measure function. Only four studies measured psychological factors. Quality ratings of all these studies range from 30% to 93% with a median of 60%, uh, which indicates that the quality of included studies was um, generally poor. What we concluded from the study is that movement, desensitisation and graded functional activity remain the mainstays of non-pharmacological intervention and are supported by the results of this review. However, despite the impact of upper limb CRPS on function and well-being, few articles measured function or psychological factors or considered patient perspectives on intervention feasibility or efficacy. Also in the literature we reviewed, there was a disproportionate emphasis on poorly justified passive therapies and sensory interventions. Articles either didn't provide rationale for their interventions or drew on a wide <coughs> range of theories regarding patha mechanisms of CRIPS as we know are uh, poorly understood to justify their interventions. So essentially in the absence of a clear understanding of pathophysiology, many different treatments are experimentally trialled. We felt there was a need to provide clear rationale for chosen interventions and ensure these link to people's value goals, not just to assumed mechanisms. Further research needs to identify people's priorities from treatment and determine whether current interventions are successfully addressing these. So that led on to our next study, um, where we interviewed people in the Wellington region about their experiences of diagnosis and treatment for upper limb CRPS. We recruited participants through online support groups and multiple public and private healthcare settings in the Greater Wellington region. Um, we had semi-structured interviews with participants who had experienced upper limb CRPS as per the Budapest criteria for more than three months and less than three years. And then we um, transcribed interviews verbatim and analysed these using a reflexive thematic analysis. So we interviewed 13 participants aged between 43 and 68 years old, 11 were female and 2 were male, and their duration of CRPS ranged from 7 months and 2 and a half years, 2.5 years. From these interviews we identified 5 themes, each with several sub-themes. So the centre woven triangle represents the interaction between interview participants' three overall healthcare experiences. And the smaller orange arrows uh, correlate to each healthcare experience and reflect what interview participants most desire to support them in their healthcare journey. The large grey arrow in the background represents participants' initial and ongoing process of navigating towards a meaningful life and self concept in the presence of CRPS. Overall, we found that participants initially engaged with healthcare out of a desire to return to being the person they used to be. The sense of self was disrupted um, by the impacts of upper limb disability and the addition of other health issues that CRPS was seen as a catalyst for. And then three interacting themes epitomised their experiences of healthcare. So underpinning these was whether people knew what was going on in their, um, knew what was happening in their physical bodies and with their healthcare. Participants described becoming increasingly aware that something wasn't right and expressed a need for information while feeling kept in the dark. This information influenced whether people felt like they were being taken seriously. Participants described going unheard in depersonalising encounters with a focus on tissues and time frames. This validation or lack thereof um, influenced whether participants, um, how information was received and whether um, healthcare systems and processes were experienced as another layer of load. Participants described feeling that no one wanted to diagnose them, that they were battling with bureaucracy, and that they were struggling to manage all the different appointments and things. These experiences influenced each participant's own process of navigating towards being the person they wanted to be. They described trying not to let CRPS stop them through a process of working around them, doing everything suggested, and noticing little milestones. 
key issues that people in our interview study brought up around diagnosis was the lack of diagnostic certainty or specificity, navigating multiple conflicting opini opinions and going long times between appointments while waiting for explanations for a very, for very challenging symptoms. So in practice, um, clinicians frequently describe patients as a bit cripsy or jot query crips in the notes. The impact of this lack of specificity on people is demonstrated in this quote by Roger. Um, his ACC claim and access to treatment was delayed because the specific language of the Budapest criteria was not used to describe his symptoms, and as such, the diagnosis of CRPS was challenged by ACC. Mm -hmm. Other participants like Kimberly talked about how subjective the diagnosis is and how they received mixed messages from doctors. One doctor thought it was this, another person thought it was this, but they didn't meet criteria. And then others talked about being kept in the dark and going weeks between follow-up because they or clinicians weren't aware of what to look out for, the urgency of getting on top of it, or the importance of communicating their suspicions to the patient themselves. These experiences resulted in increased distress for the person in pain and distrust toward healthcare providers. Similarly, key issues that people brought up around treatment were delays to accessing helpful treatment, often due to geographical location, funding constraints or wait lists. They also discussed the mental load of remembering exercises, repeating themselves to multiple clinicians, navigating complex systems and making time for and travelling to multiple appointments, all on top of managing a challenging and painful condition like CRPS. Partic participants struggled when they didn't understand the rationale for treatments, when these weren't appropriately staged for where they were at, when they couldn't see progress, and when therapists had conflicting ideas about what treatment should um, consist of. So what we concluded from these findings is that we need to provide timely, holistic, and credible information to people about CRPS throughout their healthcare journeys. We need to place more emphasis on the therapeutic alliance between the person and their healthcare providers, emphasising their um, the whole person and working towards their values and goals over low evidence therapies. This includes treating the person as an individual, building trust and rapport, listening to and validating their concerns, and not dismissing them or jumping to conclusions. And finally, we need to simplify and improve healthcare processes for people dealing with CRPS. This looks like working towards clearer pathways, straightforward claims acceptance, and a unified team approach. So this leads on to the next phase um, of our research study, the final, um, well, final stage before the write-up. Um, and we have designed a survey um, from our interview themes to explore these further New Zealand-wide, so not just in the Wellington region. So the intention from this is that we will then be able to provide recommend recommendations for a New Zealand-specific <coughs> management pathway based on people's lived experiences in, um, of and priorities from healthcare. So if you, um, if you know anyone who meets these criteria, please do share um, this information with them. But otherwise, that is me, and um, I'd love to answer any questions you might have to do my best to. Just, um, who can diagnose it? Would it be your GP, or does it have to? <laughs> 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 you um, so it depends on on the purpose of diagnosis, mm -hmm. as yeah. always. Um, for an ACC claim, yeah. um, as long as it is, it could be a hand therapist. Yeah. Okay. Um, it could be a specialist. Usually, it's a specialist yeah. because a GP isn't considered yeah. authoritative enough okay. and so that's that's one of the issues with um with it and it has to use the would have yes. criteria and if that's not used then it delays is that global is it used globally yes. the yes. best one okay yeah. that's the authoritative one yeah. yeah okay i mean it would be great if we could be better at identifying it early yeah. and using the checklist and anybody but yes yeah. Maybe just not mind that. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Mm. Do you send this presentation out as well? Or I, can yeah, you? I mean, I, I've really provided it here, so yeah, oh, you're yeah. welcome okay. to yeah, yeah. receive a copy of it. Yeah, that would be really yeah. cool. Thank you. Yeah. We'll have a, a video recording and the slides as well on our website. Oh, perfect. Mm.
interested in, um, say, you had little mirror therapy bots up there, um, and is, you know, is there any more evidence behind that now, or is that one of these things that you're referring to that may be a little bit... The, so the, okay. I think I had the... I'm not sure, I don't think any of the studies... Oh, um, it's great imagery. It's great imagery, great imagery, great imagery, great imagery, imagery, great imagery, great imagery and mirror therapy are two different things. So yeah, yeah. yeah. so yeah. great motor imagery obviously um, requires like a stepped approach, and then mirror therapy is, is just mirror therapy. So my understanding, there's not been any well for upper li for upper limb CRPS, there's not been any studies that looked at um, looked at that more more recently. I think we looked at studies that were 2005 mm. since, and um, because we wanted to use the Budapest criteria, other criteria are not particularly spe um, specific. Um, very sensitive, but not very specific. Rachel? Um, so I have a question about, so one of the things I heard quite clearly from qualitative data is that people feel in the dark, not sure what's next, a lack of clarity around the pathway. What's, a, you may not have an answer to this yet, but what's the approach around what a good clinical pathway looks like and to what extent people who experience CRPS are involved in the, a, the development of it, but also how accessible it is to them, like who owns the pathway? Is, it, owns the pathway. is it the clinicians or is it the person? So we have a charity, um, Kiwi Crips is our charity in, in New Zealand, and I think they do great work. Um, so they are, um, they are people with lived experiences of complex regional pain syndrome, um, and yeah, we've been kind of talking back and forth. Um, I think that I think they should own the pathway, um, and I I do um, I do think um, we're, we're, yeah we are talking about that peer support and how important that is for people with a rare condition. Um, to, to actually have someone else who knows what they've been through. Um, most people, which is one reason I'm finding it very hard to recruit people, most people with CRPS don't know another person with CRPS. Um, so that's very isolating. Um, what my hunch would be in terms of pathway is that, um, is that we, we train people to recognise it better. Mm -hmm. When people do recognise it, um, that they shorten the length of time between follow-up, mm -hmm. um, that they provide um, lot, they, so uh, similar to what um, what they do when they give a diagnosis of cancer, they actually sit down with the person and have a good conversation, ask the person if they have any questions and, and actually take that diagnosis quite seriously um, and provide written information to complement that verbal information because quite often someone will go home and then it's the person at home who will say, you've got what? No, they're saying it's in your head. Often that, you know, they might not have felt that, but when they try and explain that to the person at home, that's where some of those things might come in. Um, so that written information as well, and referral, referral to people in the community who can see them regularly um, and be able to support them through that journey. So whether that's for lower limb physiotherapists, for upper limb hand therapists, um, but again, there need to be training along each of those ways and then I suppose with those more I think an understanding that um, you asked if I had opinions about what would be a good I'm and I do. <laughs> <laughs> so I will just keep talking um, and yeah so I think just easier access to those those more um, high up um, permigenate infusions etc etc um, if that's given early earlier that can be get, that can be quite helpful so maybe um, pulling away some of the, the blocks to getting that earlier um, so they don't need to necessarily have a referral to the whole pain team but maybe a pain specialist um, earlier um, as they see their um, therapists in the community. Those are just some thoughts. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you for your presentation. I didn't know anything about this. Fascinating. I think probably a lot of people don't know anything about this. Which is my question, um, what is the status of health professional training? You know, how much of this is actually incorporated into training programs? That's a, a good question for um, Dr. Bronwyn <laughs> Lennox Thompson. <Yeah. laughs> so I'll, I'll speak to that because I'm the, the academic coordinator for our post grant programs in pain and pain management at the University of Otago. And we know from work that Elspeth Shipton and colleagues have done. Um, that undergraduate medical training as well as undergraduate 
physiotherapy training, occupational therapy training, um, clinical psychology training often does not include any pain apart from the neurobiology. Pain's multifactorial, so it's not it's not an easy um, topic to understand. It's a difficult thing, and it's part of everybody's life, and not everybody develops ongoing pain. So there are lots of old-fashioned models about why somebody has pain, and we're still, after many, many years, I've been doing this for, what, 30 more or more years, we still have the separation between what's going on in the body and this, this experience that we have and considering it to be in the head. It's an emergent whole person thing and that's quite challenging. And there was a bit of a problem because we've got acute pain that generally resolves pretty reasonably and we've all had that. And then we have these pains that go on um, and they don't respond to the same treatments and they need different um, management approaches and generally whole person things. Pain always affects the whole person, who you are. Um, and that's what I think those treatment, those um, qualitative statements from, from participants really show, the feeling in the dark, not believed, um, and perhaps judged about, and stigmatised often about, you've got pain, why aren't you over it yet? which does not help people. Um, that's what we want to highlight. Can I, I just um, add to that? So a um, few of us are very lucky now to go to ISCOS, the International Spinal Cord Injury Conference, and I'm presenting a poster that we did which was reporting back on um, people mm. with spinal cord injury who live with the experience of pain yep. and what they wanted from services, and I hear a lot of alignment. But one of the things they talked about and they said is that Clinicians are uncomfortable bringing up the topic of pain, A, because they don't have a fix for it, and B, they're worried they're going to make it worse because we might make people think about it more and we might entrench, you know, thinking. So let's avoid it completely. So I'm just wondering, any ideas around how you get around that? Because <laughs> if you give me the answer, I'll stand in front of the poster and tell people. If you had a simple answer, I think him probably would have found it. Yeah. But but no, you you're quite right. In um, analyses of conversations within primary care that Lee Thompson um, did, pain was often raised, but at the last part of the conversation, and the. Uh, but response was really, we'll give you a prescription. Mm -hmm. um, because the primary care GPs have so little time, and if they don't have training, um, they don't know what to do, and that's difficult. In chronic pain, it's a kind of a, well, is it because we failed, we did the wrong thing, we didn't look for the right, you know, the cause? Um, and I think that move away from pain as a linear response is really critical. Like I keep saying, it's a whole person emergent experience, and you're you're right. People, um, clinicians are scared to have that conversation. If you happen to work in the physical health area, suddenly here's a person who's really distressed, and the fear is that if we open Pandora's box, yeah. and it will all come out, and then I'm going to have to, as a physio, deal with somebody who's really scared, and I might make them worse. Mm -hmm. um, I think validation. It's a very first thing. You validate your experience is absolutely real. You acknowledge the, the, the difficulty that you're in when you've got pain. So that it's hard and that we don't always know what the right thing is to do. And one of the pieces of research that we know is that when you start opening that Pandora's box and validate and acknowledge, it actually takes less time than if you ignore it. Mm -hmm. And put it away. I think was it Peter O'Sullivan's work as well that, mm. that looks at when you actually talk about something you take the sting out of it mm. as well um, so yeah I, I think it, it's the opposite to what mm. clinicians are afraid of making it worse you talk about it and it, it, it kind of defuses the situation because um, I think a lot of the time it's that like pain and distress are often like this and I think it's often the distress that people um, clinicians are, are scared of, of working with um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, like, you know, the 
the parallel would be suicidality. If we don't talk about suicidality, then it becomes this big bogey and very scary and so nobody wants to deal with it. If we start to talk about it as a clinician, gradually it becomes easier. And for the person who's feeling dreadful, to have somebody say, let's have a talk, um, allows them to hear it. And so I think that would be helpful. Our challenge is that pain is complicated. And our everyday experience of pain is like, it will get better. And then chronic pain comes along. And 22% of New Zealanders live with pain that's been going for, few, for what, three months or longer. That's more than the incidence of diabetes, mm-hmm. of COPD, of, of osteoarthritis. And osteoarthritis is painful. Mm-hmm. Um, and our services, we can get on a little high horse. Our services for people with chronic pain are underfunded, under-recognised, mm-hmm. under-resourced, and very difficult to get into. Mm-hmm. And then we have expectations that people with pain have, which is a belief that there's some goodies tucked away for good people, mm-hmm. nice mm-hmm. people, and I'm not getting that, so therefore there's something wrong. Mm-hmm. I think a little more humility. We actually don't have very good treatments for chronic pain. What we can do is help ease the distress and the suffering, and help people do life, in the presence of pain, um, which is you know common for lots of people, mm. so and that's a difficult, difficult conversation to have. We even don't actually have how we don't know how the diagnosis you have chronic pain is given. We don't have that piece of work, which means we don't know the best way to tell somebody you've got a chronic pain problem. Mm. We don't know what's most satisfactory, and that's a huge area of research that. We will talk about this. <laughs> um, yes. Um, I work in a peer support with the spinal, awesome. and I'm working with a lot of new patients coming through the spinal, and they'll uh, often say, "Look, you know, say, I've got this pain. Um, what are we going to do? What can I do about it? And, and how long will it last for?" And I don't really want to talk about it because I don't really want to be the one that says, "Oh, probably the rest of your life." Because you know, mm. it's a, I'm not really big on giving bad news, but that's basically it. Yeah. Mm. You know, they've got all sorts of other things they're going to have to do the rest of their life too. And, mm. and uh, sadly, mm. pain is, is unlikely to, because there isn't the treatment, and, yeah. and the treatments as on, uh, you know, whether it's pre-gab or or tramadol or whatever it may be, will take the edge off potentially of it and have a lot of side effects. So um, yeah, that's why I, don't, I as a I'm not a clinician. And then the person intervening, I don't want to talk about it because I don't have a good news story to tell them. Mm-hmm. Um, and the other, the other aspect is we always talk about pain is like fight club. Mm-hmm. Well, first of all, fight club. First of all, pain is you don't talk about because mm-hmm. whilst in that moment you talk about it, it gets a lot worse. Mm-hmm. And if you're just coping with it, you suddenly talk about it, it brings it to the front of your mind. Mm-hmm. Even for me, talking about it with someone else, both my, my pain comes a lot before mm-hmm. Not that bad to be aware of it now. Too, but. So, you know, it, it's, um, it's the other inhibitor to talk about. Yeah. Self management is really the mainstay, mm. but what that looks like is really mm. not well determined. Mm. What we noticed in these studies was the fact that what people really wanted to do was play the guitar again, because that was about who they were. And, you know, I think self concept, self identity is something that occupational therapists in particular are really um, aware of, and it's absolutely absent from those outcome measures. Mm-hmm. You know, what's 30 degrees range of movement mm-hmm. improvement if it doesn't translate to, well, now I can cut my own food? Mm-hmm. So, Grace, um, Ronnie's mentioned a couple of times that pain is a whole person experience, and you know, I noticed in the review there are only a small number of um, articles that were included or found that kind of um, looked at multidisciplinary or um, interventions. So, and when you think about your management pathway recommendations, what, what would you advocate for around um, multidisciplinary um, input or interdisciplinary team management or trends, whatever you want to call it, but mm-hmm. you know, more than a single discipline therapy? What's your thoughts about that? I think there's a lot of, I think that there's a lot of barriers to accessing true interdisciplinary treatment and I think with CRPS if you you refer someone and they're waiting for the gold standard they're they're not getting treatment that you know so I think someone needs to be someone needs to not have their hopes pinned on finally getting into the pain clinic 
um, because that's going to make the job of these guys so so much harder. Um, so I I think that yeah I I think that it's more of a culture shift um, of of clinicians being um, having the the time, but um, also recognizing the need to collaborate with the GP, with the surgeon, with um, with the Fano, with different different ones. So actually, the person who is in that moment with that person in pain, having a little bit more of a holistic um, viewpoint of what's going on for that person, rather than what their what their scope is and what they're treating that person for in that moment, recognizing that it is a whole person experience and and helping to simplify that process by linking up with um, with the with the different um, providers that might be there. So so I do think it's yeah I think every, it's everybody's job to be interdisciplinary with with something like this. Yeah. Which is not yeah not discipline. Yeah. 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 A lot of people are hunting for that pharmacological yeah. solution. Yeah. Yeah. No, but mm -hmm. That's what we come across a lot of our work. Um, and just wanting that fix, and it's so hard to get them to think about things in a functional way, or well, their performance, yeah. um, occupational yeah. performance goals, and you know it's really hard to get people off that. They just want the pharmacal. You know, give me something. Yeah. Um, and we have a lot of people that end up going into. Uh, punctual conductive disorders, yeah. starting off with a fractured ankle, yeah. and then before we know it, they're in bed, yeah. bed rest 24 hours. So, that we've got a few people like that at the moment that yeah. we're dealing with who have been through the system, and, yeah. and it's, just, it's, yeah. it's just soul destroying to see these people, to yeah. be fair. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, what to do, it's hard. Yeah. Mm. I think people, people will always search, people will always mm. search for, for something else. But I think again, if you take the sting out of something um, by yeah by acknowledging that the treatments aren't great, but yes, we, we hear you, you're in pain, you you want something better, and actually are supporting that person to try and find something better with whatever you've got. Yeah. Um, quite often, there'll be there'll be less nobody recognize like again that that feeling like there's something better that no one's giving them. Mm -hmm. So I think that's where that honesty and humility comes in mm -hmm. as part of that validation process. You get that whole secondary complication yeah. of then you've yeah. been on bed for 24 hours mm -hmm. for six yeah. months and then you everything gets shown and then it. oh I know and then all your muscles are tight mm -hmm. and then you get all the secondary mm -hmm. um, pain. I don't know. It's it's a it's a terrible journey. I have to say. Yeah. Some yeah, people go sure. down the back track. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Yes. alone um, and and those that weren't that was their main thing was to be able to hold my husband's hand again was to be able to drive the kids um, for all the different things that they wanted to be able to do was to be able to cook for my son who um, has autism you know those 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 family roles were actually absolutely critical for for people and for those who didn't have those family roles um, per se, was actually returning to work and being part of their um, part of their, their mm -hmm. colleagues and that kind of sense of identity that that gave. So, um, yeah, I think that there's a lot we need to do with um, with recognizing that like that therapy happens in the real world, not in our clinics, and actually mm -hmm. engaging those those natural supports around yes. people and empowering yeah. those natural supports. Mm -hmm. um, there's a really good book called The Chronic Pain Couple um, by Kara Eloff. Um, which I've just read cover to cover, and I'm, I think I'm going to buy many, many copies and just give them to people because it, um, it's just beautiful. Um, again, this is talking about um, it's more about a, um, a couple relationship, obviously, rather than uh, other relationships in, in terms of family, but really, really practical strategies for the other person yes. to be able to support someone, and that's what a lot of people are, are wanting. How do I support my I don't know, my loved one um, who's going through this? There's a role for employers, for schools, yeah. you know, for the environment. Yeah. Yeah. 
Because part of the challenge, of, I think, in our ACC environment, mm. where the focus is on this individual, mm. not the connected person, mm. um, and the focus is often on clinical centric, clinic, yeah, clinician centric processes. So we'll do therapy in a, in a building that's separate from somebody's home. Mm -hmm. um, occasionally we'll go out to do stuff in the real world. Mm -hmm. um, but then, so a lot of the challenges, how do you go from this con nice, constrained, um, secure, settled environment to this crazy world that's out there, of which you found there are huge parts. Mm -hmm. And people's social self is, is really important. Mm -hmm. Um, what so I guess underpinning a lot of like the discussions are about um, kind of health professionals not quite being equipped to deal with this whole complexity that is like chronic pain, and I know from my experience, like I've been quite fortunate enough to go on like pain courses and stuff, but. There's actually not a huge amount around, is there? <laughs> so, yeah. for clinicians, at, like kind of opening up Pandora's box and not quite wanting to do that because they're um, <coughs> fearful of not knowing how to cope with it. Actually, it's it. I feel like it's quite often people are willing to, but it's just not having those tools in the tool box mm -hmm. to know how to actually cope mm -hmm. um, and to deal with those issues when they come up. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, it's quite useful to kind of spread awareness in this way um, and for people to be able to kind of like meet like-minded people. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm just curious how much, like like you said, training is done kind can of I, early. Can I, add, can I add to that? So I teach a neuro rehab paper through the University of Otago, Wellington. And it, um, last last time I had, um, I happened to have a musculoskeletal physiotherapist who works in the pain management service in that course. And, she, and all the assignments are really clinically focused and she was like I can't do anything because I don't do neuro and I was like can you look into pain in a neurological context and do a presentation to the class around managing pain and it was really helpful like they all found it helpful but what I really noticed was she skipped over that first bit she said just do all the usual stuff that you do yeah. when you talk to someone who has chronic pain and that was the <laughs> question yeah. that the, all of the neuro physios and OTs that, yeah. and psychologists didn't know what to do mm -hmm. so even training for that really basic stuff like role playing an uncomfortable conversation mm -hmm. how do you have a conversation so people start to feel mm -hmm. a bit more confident about mm -hmm. talking about pain that they don't feel like they have to a, mm. you know, but it's really hard stuff to be in, isn't it? Mm. You don't want to be there. Mm. No. Yeah. So, so actually, just just some skills, sharing yeah. skills with their specialist pain people, and mm. in, in that space could be really helpful. Mm. Just put a suggestion. Well, again, I want to do. I want to put in another paper for our program on these on-campus clinical skills. How do you do this? Mm. It isn't rocket science, and it's not turning you into a psychologist. It's really bizarre because psychosocial factors are the most dominant factors in chronic pain management that influence outcomes. And in our ACC contracted services, we get physiotherapy and psychology. Mm -hmm. And the psychologists may or may not have any knowledge of pain leaving the physio to do an awful lot of stuff that they don't feel comfortable with and there's no OTs. And it's not generally about the doing. When people leave our services and they go to live, I hope, their own lives, not something that some clinician has thought about. Let's do, do three sets of ten every morning of whatever exercise. <laughs> Sorry, I'll <laughs> I think it's a clinician thing in general, isn't it? I mean, you know, it's just generic. It's, it's something that we should all be doing if, if we're clinician. We've been asking those questions mm. in a way that ascertains the whole person, not just the problem. It's not just a, a sore tie no, exactly. or, or a hand, it's a person who happens to have that, that part of the body that's painful. But it's not, not just the elbow, you're treating it. 
I just want to say thank you very much for your talk. Um, it's not a topic I knew anything about in relation to that specific example that creates the pain, but I think as you've seen from all of the conversation, the concept of pain management and pathways for clinicians to understand and what to do with is a huge topic and it's one that um, I personally have interest in as well. Um, and I think there is so much that um, both your work's going to do specifically for this area, but also open up more conversations, um, be it at a target, be it within, um, maybe we need to get into the medical training as well to, to give some examples, but also just to normalise some of those conversations because I, I think Andrew's commentary about um, not wanting to be the bearer of bad news is quite pertinent to that concept of how to actually have those conversations when there is the potential that it is going to be chronic and there isn't a silver bullet and there's not a pharmacological answer that's hidden away that, yeah, it's so multifaceted. So, so um, thank you very much. Um, I do think you found it interesting and I think many people did find all those conversations and hopefully you'll continue to have a bit more conversations and have some meetings. Thank you.